Okay. Give us one second. We're having just a quick talk here. Let me go back to the quick webinar outline. We'll define and discuss some of these terms around high availability, HR and DR, disaster recovery. We'll also speak about that relationship to other, quote, planning disciplines, whether that's business continuity crisis, risk, compliance in your organization. And of course, high availability infers that you want to avoid downtime, planned or on time, and then that connection to the overall organizational objectives. We'll touch a little bit on emergency, emerging technologies and trend. Towards the end, we'll show you some strategies and examples. We're going to try and blend in here some tips, professional tips they're kind of labeled as, and some strategies, things for you to consider. And these tips are based upon real world experience, whether it's consulting or doing auditing, as Linda had mentioned, or education in a number of firms around the world. So we're trying to bring you a pretty broad perspective. The key here is talking about different data availability today. There's a lot of terms that are being used out there, sometimes inaccurately, sometimes uh, it's a marketing blend and terms that get a little bit confused. So you see terms like redundancy and fault tolerance and high availability and DR. And many times these terms may be used different or differently. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And over to the poll. So on the poll we're saying, for you folks and those that you work with, do these people understand the difference between the terms in your organization? We'll give that a few moments while the poll results come in. In the meantime, I'm going to move to the next slide. All right, it looks like um, about 20% of you have it clearly defined and about an equal number um, use, the use the terms interchangeably. And that's really the challenge that we're facing in the marketplace today, especially when we're talking about high availability and disaster recovery. And so this is um, one of the reasons why we wanted to run this webinar today. I did forget to mention earlier that if you have questions, questions as you go. Most of you have been using the questions pane, so go ahead and continue using those questions pane and I'll monitor that. And um, the webinar will be available if you'd like to view it again. Um, we don't share the PowerPoints themselves, but the webinar will be viewable for 30 days for everybody and then after that in our library for our members. All right, Jim, back to you. All right, Jim, back to you. So one key requirement consistent across here is an information technology or an ICT, information communication technology. In other words, a technology infrastructure that you can depend on. So let's talk about high availability and fault tolerance. Those are really types of redundancies that are built and defined and driven towards the data processing and the critical environment infrastructure. And like everything, equipment can fail, break down, mechanical, electrical, software problems, as you've probably all seen. If and when that fails or you have an outage, you need to manage that. And that crosses over to your backup strategy, if you have one, and your disaster recovery program. So let's take a moment and define high availability as it should be used across the profession. Having a little fun on the left, is high availability is really driven towards the system and the components, making sure that they're durable and operate. So for example, if a server fails, then there's an additional server that should come online to minimize that. If it's a component in the network, it's similar, et cetera. So that is driven for high availability in the engineering and the design of your technical environment. So high availability in the old days, I had a spare tire. 
quickly available. So for your planning in high availability, it's across your computer system or your entire network. Since this is a complex environment and consists of many parts, the design and the engineering perspective is to make sure that that is carefully planned for. And this goes over including where's your data? How is it being backed up? Is it available? Do you fail over in your data? Is that a failable failover in your own environment? Or is it in one location on premise? How do you store and keep your data? But more importantly, how do you keep it accessible to your users? Fault tolerance is a different aspect of that. It relies upon specialized hardware and the ability to detect a fault in a component or a hardware or a piece uh, in, the, in the technical uh, engineering group and whether that's failed. And as I'd mentioned, whether it's a processor or a board or a power supply or some kind of storage system. Fault tolerant models frequently do not address software failures. And we have software failures. And for you folks that are in the technical environment, whether it's a problem with the software or doing updates or patches or revisions or patch party. Down at the bottom, we have a simple, more of a facilities aspect. A building that has a backup generator, for example, when that gets up to speed and is running, will give you consistent voltage in your outlets, as you would expect if you're running on a public switch utility. Let's do a little bit of a quick comparison between high availability on your screen, on the left as you're looking at it, versus fault tolerance. High availability, as you would expect from its uh, from its name, tries to minimize service disruption and downtime. Fault tolerance is a safeguard against component or equipment failure. With high availability, it's not complete availability, which is really not achievable. You're willing to absorb a small amount of downtime depending on your organization. And we'll talk about that in a little bit in this seminar. It is a cost-effective solution, but like all of these, it's expensive. Fault tolerance is intended to have no service interruption because a particular piece of equipment fails. Depending upon your design and your fault tolerance, this can become significantly expensive. High availability, again, is looking at the technical infrastructure, the equipment during normal operations. Fault tolerant can be used on systems that have a, can have a significant impact, whether that's on life, such as medical devices or others. Moving to the next slide, we're gonna talk about a quick backup strategy, having your data available the best rule of thumb that's used in most organization is multiple copies. So you have a primary copy of your data that you're using in day-to-day -day normal operations. Then you have a backup in case there's a problem where you need to restore that original copy. Then you normally have an additional copy which you get off premise or off site which would be if you lose the entire facility designed to be able to restore and recreate and continue operations. So different ways to keep that data, and we'll touch on that a little bit later also on some of the examples at a high level. It could be on local drives, it could be on a storage array, it could be on tape. Off-site, are you sending it to another of your existing locations, or are you sending it to uh, a provider or a partner or a sourcing or a cloud service, or are you sending it basically to an Iron Mountain uh, data repository? In either case, you need to protect the organizational data. If you don't have your data, then you're a startup organization, and that's not generally survivable. 
IT, Disaster Recovery. It is the resources and activities required if you do have an outage, and it's more than a component, it's system-wide, whether it's driven by a weather condition, whether it's driven by a natural event, um, that compromises the ability to function. And these include not only the entire component, but their capability. And on the right-hand side, there's some examples of percentages from different studies of what causes outages. So a quick comparison. Seems like we're having a little bit of time in here. Okay, comparing high availability and DR. Again, and I'm gonna click forward on a few of these. High availability is really redundancy within the data center or your critical environment and it has the capability to fail over within that data center or perhaps to a secondary uh, production site. Disaster recovery, when effectively employed, uses an alternate, hopefully geographically alternate site. And the rationale for that, you don't want one event or a problem to, uh, to impact and affect and bring down your primary and secondary site. High availability really is designed for, again, as I'd mentioned, a single component or a set of components that's kind of predictable where it can fail over. And again, high availability is on technology design and implementation. Disaster recovery helps you to reestablish those services after an incident or events and multiple failures within your data center. Whereas DR also includes people, processes, and gauges a larger business rather than just the IT operational staff. All right, let's launch our next poll. And we're gonna be looking at, you know, has your organization decided that high availability and fault tolerance can replace DR? So your choices are yes, we no longer have DR. Somewhat, we have a lot more resources dedicated to high availability and fault tolerance. Or no, we utilize each of those strategies. And we'll give you about 10 seconds to poll. Looks like about half of you have voted. We're going down to five more seconds. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close it. It is really good to see that only 1% of you have gotten rid of DR. And it's probably part of our target audience are people that work in disaster recovery as well. And it's good to see that you are utilizing each one of those strategies. But it's still kind of a 75, 25% um, piece here, which is a little different than what we had expected. Thank you for sharing. Okay, so if your servers in your critical environment can survive almost all the time, very frequently you use a series of nines. There's up to five nines, which is commonly used, which is based upon availability. The five nines, depending if you're running 24 hours a day by seven days a week by forever. In other words, you need to always be up. That only gets you seconds in many cases or minutes of downtime during the course of a year. Consider also if you're not a high availability always online environment, if your business works business hours, Maybe you're open seven to seven, Monday to Friday, and half a day on Saturday for work. Or maybe you're open during uh, a particular uh, time zone period uh, around the globe. So you need to recalculate that. Whereas disaster recovery is also a complete set of plans, as I'd mentioned earlier, or it's a program that is designed to deal 
with every conceivable event that you can plan for. Here's a professional tip, and this just comes from experience when you talk about going through the examples. Wherever you can, internally at least, use consistent terms and definitions. Make sure that everybody understands the terms that you're using, at least internally. You're not going to change the entire business sector of IT because uh, vendors and providers and salespeople are constantly marketing and changing terms. Second, if you use the word tier, I've given seven presentation about the trail of tears. <laughs> uh, an example, frequently I see a BC example in business continuity. It's like our most important stuff, our highest is tier one and we need them right away. You need to talk with your data center operators if they are aligned with someone like uptime. A tier one for uptime is a best effort, break fix, call me when it breaks. On the other end, uptime uses a one, two, three, and four approach. And in their definition, along with TIA 942, some of the standards, tier three and tier four are really high availability. And we'll talk about that uh, a little later. Another professional tip. We're talking about high availability in DR. Make sure you see the big picture, which goes back to the agenda. These are incredibly important, but it also goes to understanding to other uh, practices and other areas and disciplines in your organization. If you're in business continuity and using those terms, that's a marvelous example, or if you're using crisis management or incident management in your organization, or if you're more government, where you're using continuity of operations. A couple of more professional tips here, and these are commonly encountered issues. First off, having the data center is not your job as the data center manager or director. It really is, but it's an organizational issue. It's not at a department or a unit level. So ask yourself, were you there when this data center is designed? Or how old is your infrastructure? Is it brand new a couple of years and you were involved in the design? Or is it five, 10, 15 years old? or longer, a legacy system, and you're trying to keep it running. Other tips, and I'll just move through these a little bit. Work with other areas in the organization, whether it's compliance, internal audit, or regulator. Recognize where you have silo. If you have multiple departments doing the same or similar functions, but they're not sharing. Leverage and share where you can with other centers of excellence. Make sure you coordinate your IT, DR, and high availability with some of these other areas. So capabilities, EOCs, if, or if you do crisis management, or if you have emergency management. Then, recognizing after the professional tip that Disaster recovery is absolutely critical to your business continuity and the organizational objectives. A DR is a cost-effective solution that can help you deliver the technology that you need to have within time on that 24 by 7 by forever. DR is absolutely critical and linked to manage the technology if there's a failure. To talk about a couple of principles of IT disaster recovery, and then we'll compare some of those similar undertakings and principles to high availability in a few moments. So the principles, the six ones that are generally most accepted is protect your organization, be able to quickly detect and react and recover and get back into an operational mode as quickly as possible. 
then return from that interim contingency operating mode to business as usual as quickly as possible. Some key elements in IT disaster recovery. People. Give me one second here. You need your people. We're having a timing issue. You need your locations, your premises. You need your site. Of course, you need your technology. You need your network and capabilities and your voice and application data. You have IT, information communication processes. And then we all are exposed to the supply chain where you have vendors, capabilities, suppliers, network, public service providers. Let's take a look at some of the key tenants of disaster recovery that are employed at successful organizations. Some of the threes to remember is to automate your disaster recovery as much as possible. So how do you fail over from a primary to a secondary site? Of course, preventing that downtime as much as possible in your production environment, and that includes testing and simulation exercises and drill and avoiding outages and aggressively managing dependencies and related tools and capability. A couple more tips. For successful organizations, DR is removed from the production environment, at least the data backup. So your backups are vital. So get them in a place where they're not effective. DR is your fallback. When you have cascading errors and things going wrong, and you need to start bringing things back into operations. DR is not generally you know, a multi-second or less than a minute act activity. It can be all day or multi-days to survive. DR is to get the environment back in line. We're coming into football season. So I was using a little bit of uh, maybe if you're a US football fan, an analogy. It's that punt, fourth and long, it's that Hail Mary. But make sure as you're talking with your people that are in your IT or your vendors or suppliers that your DR is included, as it looks on the poll from this group, is included in your technology design. Crossing from hardware to systems to fillable. Then you get back to a basic question, which is, how do you make that determination and who made that determination on how available you need to be. Again, going back, is it 24 by 7, or is it during business hours? So you need to confirm this information and keep it up to date by working with the organization. So your business continuity people and your DR people and coordinators do understand that. So let me use a, just a difference here. Here's just a simplified example of uh, how people come out of the BIA. So if you do a business impact analysis, and notice across the top, I did not use that term tier one, two, three, or four. I use some simple business language. If it's critical, I need it very fast. RTO, most people are familiar with, how quickly, my, what's my recovery time? RPO, how much data can I lose? And then maybe it's a listing of different applications. And then maybe your next category, you've got a little bit more wiggle room. You've got some more time and money. You know, it's going to be painful, but it's not life-threatening. And finally, maybe it's a category like required, which gives you some more time and the cost and the service impact. And then maybe a last category is best efforts, where it's not the most critical things that you do. So you have some constraints. No organization has unlimited resources. So what are your costs? What are you virtualizing? 
How big of a site are you talking about? What are your distance limitations? How manual and how automated are you? So what are some of these other things beyond a business impact analysis that you'd look at? What I see mature organizations and organizations that are able to achieve certification may be using similar terms but expanding and broadening out. Whether that's combining a risk assessment or talking about a risk tolerance or maybe they're doing application criticality assessments within the IT environment or maybe they're combining their BIA with their risk assessment. All of this really leads to making some decisions. And those decisions include a cost-benefit analysis, getting approval from the organization, looking at what your cost of downtime is or your exposure versus your cost to address that. And again, that all links to the organizational objectives and how much downtime outage tolerance that you have and how deep are your pockets and what kind of resource and allocation and funding do you have? Linda, poll? Which leads us to our next poll, which is the question, to what extent is your organization utilize the results of the BIA and risk assessment to really determine what's covered under your high availability, fault tolerance, or DR? So we'll give us about 20 seconds or so, so please vote quickly. Give me about five more seconds. This is something we're actually seeing globally with these results is that people are either using the BIA or the risk assessment or none. And if you, what's kind of disconcerting is how are they, how are organizations determining what needs to be available when and where you're going to store it and how you're going to access it, which is what Jim started with, if you're not looking at both the BIA and the risk assessment together. So less than, we have about 40%, which is less than half of the people here are using both of those. I'll just extend on that comment a little bit. BIA's risk assessment, it's data collection, it's research, it's gathering facts as much as you can to present that to management for a decision. I really like this chart and I've been able to use it effectively because when they talk about a picture is worth a thousand words, this covers a lot of information. Across the bottom access in red, it's the time element. How quickly do you need it? And up the right-hand axis is how, is how important is the business process or the data or the, the criticality of the organization? The little swell down the, uh, where it says data protection methods, these are different techniques that have been used over time and are still in practice, whether it's just backup tapes or whether it's some kind of vaulting or mirroring or point in time copying. Then across the top, the different technologies that you would see in the green that you would run into, whether it's just doing a backup, whether it's some kind of bare metal or snapshots or some kind of clustering or asynchronous or synchronous replication, or if you get into wide area global clustering or multiple data center strategies. And notice again, I did not use tiers. The top right, your most critical stuff, people like the color code, maybe that's platinum. Gold, for your next level, it's important. Maybe it's silver for systems recovery, or maybe it's bronze for best efforts to just be able to differentiate. And this is a nice way to talk with your management, your business people and say, here's where we're at on this scale. And you can put a mark and say, where do we need to be and what makes sense? Do you really need high availability? Again, I will counsel you. There is 
uh, a very clear trend with bosses and management to say, well, we spent all this money on high availability. How come we have an outage? Make sure that you tell people there will be outages, whether they're planned or unplanned. They're unavoidable. So do you need high availability? Then you need to configure how you fail over across systems. If you remember, I talked about a few key tenants of DR. There's some similar tenants in high availability, and this is a chance to leverage. Remember I said automate your DR? Well, automate your high availability. If you're driving to prevent downtime, and also looking at managing interdependencies that are constantly changing as you do business to business and connecting with your customers and your suppliers. So when you start to hear, just a strategy thought, okay, when you start to hear these terms like active, 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 passive, This gets very expensive, and it gets complex. Sorry about that, I hit the wrong button. But active, active really is when you hit that button like I just did. Okay? That information is then immediately available at a different location or a different environment. Active, active is very expensive. That is, I mentioned uptime earlier, a TIA 942. Those standards and good practices, active active means a lot of money and a lot of redundancy and a lot of careful engineering. Active, that would be a tier four generally in the uptime world, whereas a tier three is generally more of an active passive where it can fail over but quickly. Another strategy to discuss with your technologists is when you get into this idea of N plus one, if you've heard that, N really basically what N stands for need. What do you need to operate? What do you need to accomplish that mission or keep that system going? And then plus one, so you build a redundant or an additional device. N plus two is higher, and then you see things like N plus N, or you see terms, you may hear two N plus one or two N, then you're getting into approaches that are very high availability, normally upper tier three approaching tier four in the world of uptime for a reference. Another strategy, what are you using in the cloud? There's a variety of cloud options that you can talk about. Internal clouds, external clouds, and we'll have a poll about this in a little bit and a couple other comments. Or it can be the public cloud or the private cloud, whether you're going to some of the bigger ones or AWS with the Zamadon or Azure. So you, using that software as a service or a DR as a service, are you doing some kind of hybrid cloud or multi-cloud, or are you doing something internally where you're doing your own cloud for your most critical stuff and putting uh, a different selection out in the environment? Your strategy needs to look at the critical environment that supports the business activities, whether that's billing or finance or money or customer service or whatever your keys are. Another strategy to maintain, as we slide through this simple depiction of why the IT high availability data is there, you need to do maintenance. This is a consistency I see. If your company has a little downturn in revenue and they're saying, let's defer maintenance, that is going to create a problem. So make sure you're talking with your facilities and data center people and your vendors about different types of aggressive maintenance, preventive or predictive maintenance, or rather than just break fixed approach. So take a quick look at maintenance. That's an entire discipline where you get into terms like 
mean time to failure, mean time between failure, expected usable life, and that's on a variety of equipment, whether it's a generator, a UPS, a server, or a hub Muxum router. So Jim, we did have one question about regional diversity that came in and they wanted to know how far would be considered regional diversity. That's been an ongoing question and article for 20 years. If I'm asked that, I say 500 miles. It may not be achievable if you're in the US and you're on the Atlantic seaboard, head towards the Midwest. If you're on the Pacific or West Coast, head towards the Midwest. If you're in the upper Midwest, head south. Okay. As far apart regional diversity, multinationals normally have some kind of follow the sun capability. And I am seeing a trend where they don't have all, if you have a critical department, they're not allowed to be in the same time zone. They need to move from maybe Eastern Standard Time to Central Standard Time, which gets you some immediate regional diversity in theory in many cases. Move north, south, east, or west, wherever that you can. The main impetus is goes back to your risk assessment and exposure. You don't want a single event to take out your primary, your backup, and all your options. Great question. Uh, rule of thumb, I said, Work towards 1,000 miles or 500 miles. If you can get there, at least you have an objective rather than conveniently on the other side of town. Here's some things to consider in regional diversity. And that was a great question. So data centers, look at different sites. If you have a critical environment, one key indicator if your main data center is got business people and your executive office is, that's an issue because they're designed and engineered for different purposes. So look for every opportunity to separate the business from the critical environment. Look for every opportunity where a single event, whether it's weather or a seismic event or a forest fire or just a chemical spill, all the things that we look at, that a single event doesn't take out your primary, your backups, and your thirds. Different time zones, regional workers, more and more organizations are looking at their depth chart and their bench strength, where their people are, can they shift things across the country. So a quick professional tip, in addition, competence and professional development if you're looking at most standards and regulation, there's normally something that talks about competence to the people that are doing the work. Keep up to date on specialty skill set, whether that's in IT or whether that's in facilities or whether that's uh, in your financial areas, something that's not a commodity. Talk to your HR people. How do you recruit and retain your talent? You don't always want to be replacing key personnel. Provide for and encourage formal training. It's a lot easier to train the people you have and continue to develop them. They know the environment than to go out and get all new people and then try and get them up to speed. In addition, see what makes sense for credentialing or certification. I'm a big fan of that. You send people to a local user group, it might be an AFCON chapter meter or an executives and council. Okay. And make sure your documentation is up to date. In addition, hang on here. This slid by me a little quickly, hang on. Some additional things to consider. Kind of a deeper dive, what to talk about with your experts, your technical experts and your planners and your technical architects, whether they're your vendors or suppliers. Have a conversation about high availability, en high availability engines. That's in the high availability area that manages and tracks a bunch of the occurrences within their design and engineering. Talk about 
not only are you probably doing virtualization, but have a discussion of what how that DR is happening in a virtual environment. What kind of failover choices that they've already made, whether that goes off-site, off-premise, or to a different location or to virtual machines. So just because it's virtualized doesn't mean that it's safely protected. And the challenge with virtualization is it turns equipment and knowledge into data. So we're back to managing data. For your DR folks, here's more of a traditional timeline, and I'll just touch on it. You probably see something that looks like this, simpler or more complex, which is you have the little fire burst there where disruption occurs, and it talks about your RPO and you go back, your recovery point. When was your last good data? That also applies to non-technical. That could be work in progress or a clean desk policy. And then there's all kinds of R that we've adopted. How do you react, recover, respond, and recover to different examples? Trying to depict the timeline and how that works over. Just in there as a reference, you've probably used that and used it in between. I like this because it's a way to kind of see and have a discussion internally and with your key people what kind of technologies they're using. So what's backing up? And just some example before the failure, how do they back it up? And after the failure, how do you get it back? So putting something like this together and bringing in the element of time and talking about the technical aspects may be a value to your organization. As I'd mentioned earlier, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Then you need to also bring that across to your business areas to make sure that your technology and the data and what they're accessing that then links into their business and critical activities and how they treat those examples. And there's a number of challenges, as you'll see across the bottom, which is, do you have the right people? How quickly do you recognize? Did, was there an error? Do you have the wrong team? Did you put wrong people? Uh, trying to do the right thing, and they just were not equipped or positioned to make that effective. Okay. Here's just a little bit of backup storage types. Hang on, that went one click too fast. Just a very simple example. How do I back up things? You know, in the old days, it might be a floppy or the tape, or maybe now you're seeing more and more external drives that are removable media, or is it into some kind of disk or storage array, or are you going out to the cloud? That's all data backup. And there's different ways to do it and techniques. Unfortunately, there's no single silver bullet, no matter what that salesman tell you. Professional tip. You do all of these backups. Are they usable? Pretty common, you will fail backups or there's corruption or you can't access them or it's a wrong version or people lost work in progress. Part of the most effective way of testing is can the business access it? Can they use it? So professional tip, constantly look to implement and improve what your backup strategy is doing. You can only recognize that through testing. So here's some different research that's telling you that our data is critical. We need it faster than ever before in our history. So how do we get there? Part of that way might be through your virtualization and how you're backing up that virtualization. So is it a virtual machine? Are you doing something in your own LAN? Are you then taking it from your LAN and pushing it out to your own backup facility? Or are you picking it up to uh, a data repository or a data bunker? Are you sending it out to the cloud or to a vendor? Okay. 
look and optimize some of that. If any of you have been out to the cloud, and I'm talking about the vendor-driven cloud versus your own you know, custom private cloud that you may have built, you all want to know where your data is because it's important. And just having a little bit of fun with this cartoon, which is, where's your data? You can read the cartoon. So when you ask questions to your vendor that is responsible for keeping your environment up and say, where is my stuff? Can you give me the street address? Can I come look and see which facility? Or do you get an answer that you're, uh, you're in this region? Or you might be generally in this node, and it might be gives you a sense you're in the Midwest or the East Coast, or maybe you're in Asia Pacific or in a region of the EMEA. A key point, and I slid through it a little bit, if you are going to the cloud, understand the cloud provider's primary responsibility is for high availability and to keep that infrastructure using their infrastructure up. If you are going to the cloud, you need to modify your environment and your systems to fit into their world. If you're going to the cloud and you picked one vendor over another and down the road you decide you want to switch vendors, then again you need to adjust your environment to theirs. And again, that's just the design and the technical environment. The data is still your business. They'll help you protect it, but are you getting it backed up? Are you susceptible to cyber attack? Are you susceptible to ransomware through your environment? Most vendors are going to put that back on you. So you might have a service level agreement that's put in place where maybe they will get things back for you quickly, or there will be some kind of penalty that comes into play. Understand there is no perfect world. Even the cloud is not perfect 100% available. It is at best highly available. And on a regular basis, if you do the research, you see there are major outages that affect and impact customers that have moved out of their own environment into some kind of externally hosted environment. That's the nature of the beast. The main tip here is for you to consider when your management makes a decision for business reasons or whatever, or keeping, um, keeping the right ski set, skill sets and expensive, there's still exposure to potential outages. Next. So we're going to launch our next poll, which is, you know, do you use one of those clouds? Do you know what's the street address where your data is stored? We did have one question, Jim, that you might want to consider while they're taking this poll. The question is, um, how does the typical geographical data center separation apply to cloud hosting solutions? If it is one of these cloud providers or similar in a regional smaller scale, they have multiple locations with a, normally a very robust network where maybe if you're in Chicago, you might have data uh, that may be, uh, you may have an additional site connection, swing your people and their connectivity to Denver or Indianapolis, or maybe it's going to Nashville or uh, different that's what they've built into their cloud. Just a little known tip here. So you might want to ask people, where did this idea of the cloud came from? What's the source? In the past, if you've ever done any kind of engineering design and use a Microsoft product to 
draw out your network. Once you go outside of your physical network, there was that little cloud out there. That's where the cloud came from. It was from that Microsoft engineering design software tool. Linda? So I really found it interesting that we still have about 21% of the people that don't use cloud at all. Um, and then I, I was kind of curious that 14% don't think anyone's ever asked. So it may be a question you want to consider. And there's still 18% that said um, they won't tell me. However, I, you know, the positive sign here is that almost, um, you know, what, 48% of you, almost half of you know the region or you know exactly where all of your cloud data is stored. We had we had one more question and it had to do with service level agreements and and having access to um understand that your data should, if you have a service level agreement in the cloud, that that information should be protected, that your data is actually still secure. Do you have any, that's a little bit outside of the target of what you were talking about. I'm not sure um, if you have anything to comment on that. Yeah, I have two comments. A service level agreement, right? That's nice. It's a penalty and it normally involves what you're paying them for a service. For example, if you're, one of your 800 lines goes down, you might get a credit for the cost of that line. What you're looking for is the cost of the business that you transact through that line or the business that you transact, which is normally significant higher. So it's a risk transference. Second off, um, even the big vendors get hacked or they have intrusion and detection. Best way to do that is bring out compliance Send your auditors out there. Make sure that you have the ability to review and check their environment. If you're not able to do that because you don't know where that environment is, that might be a exposure and risk that is brought up through your compliance or internal audit team. So just to remind you, we have um, two more webinars this year. We may be adding one in um, November, December. We do have some challenges with all the holidays that people do have challenges um, joining us in November and December. But next month, we're going to be talking about managing risk through um, management systems. And in October, we're going to be looking at data center efficiency. Let me just double check that we don't have any other questions that we didn't get to. Just, and as a reminder, you will get a certificate of attendance if you attended at least 30 minutes. And um, you, so that'll give you your one hour of CEUs and that the webinar will be available um, probably in it within 24 to 48 hours on our webinar website if you'd like to view it again or, re, um, or just you know check out what some of the slides were. People have been asking questions like, do we give out the PDFs? Do we give out the slides? Well, we do not do that. So I, I'm sorry to tell you that. Anyways, thank you very much for coming today. And we um, look forward to having you join us at the next webinar.